If we're honest, we'll admit hockey often doesn't get the same respect in the U.S. that the other major league athletics get. But the Stanley Cup Finals provide a different level of intensity that attracts more fans. And as Amna Navaz tells us, there are two great stories behind this year's face-off. Judy, the Las Vegas Golden Knights may be the most successful expansion team ever in North America. In their very first season as a team, they made it to the finals. And they did it by scooping up talent that was basically unprotected by rival teams. The Washington Capitals, on the other hand, have knocked on the door of the finals a few times already. But even with one of the league's best players, they've come up short every time. In fact, since 1984, they've blown a big lead in a playoff series 10 times times. This year, the battle for Lord Stanley's Cup is tied at one game apiece, and tomorrow night, the Caps and the Knights face off for Game 3 in Washington, D.C. Joining us now is Greg Wyshynski. He is ESPN's senior NHL writer, creator of the Puck Daddy Hockey blog at Yahoo, and co-host of the hockey podcast Puck Soup. Greg, you're a busy man. Thanks for making the time. <laughs> uh, my pleasure. Uh, listen, let me ask you about this now. Perspective on this matchup, just when you're looking at the Golden Knights, they weren't even a team a year ago. How crazy is it that we're talking about them as a potential championship winner? Well, I mean, everybody you talk to now will say, oh, we saw it coming. But, of course, no one saw it coming. No one thought they would be a playoff team. No one certainly thought they would challenge for a championship. Um, but you can see the roots for this in the expansion draft in the sense that they were given, unlike the other expansion teams for the last 30 years, a better cut of player. The NHL made the rules a little bit tighter on teams. So not only did the Golden Knights get better players in the draft, but the teams were then leveraged into trading players to make sure that certain guys weren't taken. So the top line for the Golden Knights, their three best players, William Carlson, Riley Smith, and Jonathan Marshall, so all acquired by a trade versus being drafted. So now we're looking at Las Vegas as a potential championship sports town. It's not exactly one with like a storied sports history, right? What does it mean to you looking on this now from the perspective of folks who live there that they haven't really had? They've had some semi-pro teams yeah. come through, right? They had a run with college basketball and the run in Rebels in the 80s and 90s. They could have a championship on their hands. You know, I'm somebody who thinks that it's too much too soon. I think they should lose <laughs> and then be hungrier for the win next time. But, you know, I talked to a lot of Vegas locals when I was there, and, and they made it clear to me, you know, we are long-suffering. We've waited decades for a team to come here professionally. It's just that leagues were always worried about, because of the gambling aspect, about, you know, match-fixing and things like that. So they never had a team put there. But the other thing about Vegas that's important to remember about this team is how bonded the Golden Knights are with the city after the shooting tragedy on 1 October. Mm -hmm. uh, their first home game was several days after the shooting. Their first home game featured players walking out on the ice with first responders. Uh, a player by the name of Derek Engelin, who's a, a, guy, a resident of Vegas even before he was a member of the team, giving a, an impassioned speech about how much the city means to him and how much the team wants to mean to the city. And everywhere you go around, around the arena, you see Vegas strong things. Uh, first responders and, and victims' families are honored at games. There is a bond between the city and this team that no one could have anticipated because of this tragedy. And there's no question that the motivation to play for that city and that community has been one of the reasons they've thrived this year. So folks in Vegas have been waiting a while for an opportunity like this. Fair to say the same for folks in Washington, <laughs> yeah. D.C., right? The last time that they were playing for the Cup, it was 1998, yep. right? Yep. Uh, they got swept by Detroit. Mm -hmm. It was not a good no. time for them. What would that mean to the folks in D.C. to it, actually win? It'd be tremendous. I mean, it, the, the drought in D.C., sports-wise, goes well beyond that. Back to the Redskins' last Super Bowl as far as the last championship they've had here. But the amazing thing about the Capitals' run is that for year after year after year with Alex Ovechkin, the aforementioned superstar on the team, uh, they were always predict predicted for big things, to win the Cup, maybe. And they never would. They would always lose in the second round, usually to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And so this year, there were no expectations, really. You know, the, the window of opportunity looked like it was closed. They were going to go with a younger team, uh, a less proven team, and no one really expected them to win. So, of course, what do they do? They start winning. They get past Pittsburgh for the first time in Ovechkin's tenure with the team. And now they're playing for the Cup, and a year after everybody assumed their window to win was closed... And uh, it just goes to show, you never know. You never know what's going to happen for your team. You never know. Game three will be one to watch. That's tomorrow night. Greg Wyshynski, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me.